Okay. Hi, guys. All right. The clock is running, and there are a zillion questions to ask. <laughs> this is Wes Moore. If you don't know him, get to know him. He's the governor of the great state of Maryland. Hi, hey guys. Hi, Laura. Wes, I I'm thrilled that you're here. There's so much to cover, but we have to start with the last reason Maryland was on all of our, in all of our focus, and it was the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. How did it happen? <laughs> uh... Well, there's still investigations to figure out exactly what happened, um, uh, and it shouldn't have. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, I, I say I've, I've come to learn in this job that when my phone rings in the middle of the night, I'm never about to get good news. Um, and at 2.02 in the morning, our, uh, our fantastic chief of staff, Big and Harris, gives me a call. Uh, and he says, uh, you know, Gov, the, the key bridge is gone. And I'm like, I'm sorry, um, which, which key bridge? <laughs> Are you talking about? And then he explains it's, it's Duck Key Bridge. And, you know, I remember that, that first morning uh, coming with a very clear realization that we now had a, a ship that was the size of three football fields. That was the weight of the Washington Monument that was now trapped in the middle of the Patapsco River. And, and let's be clear, the Port of Baltimore, which was then closed at that moment, is about, worth about 13% of our state's economy. Um, we had tens of thousands of people that were about to wake up and realize they didn't have a job. Um, six people, who, uh, six souls who were unaccounted for. And, um, and the thing that we know is when you think about that situation, that scenario, um, we had more questions than answers uh, in that morning. But the way that the state rallied, the way that the state responded, um, you know, when people said that they were afraid of what the unemployment rate was going to be for the month of April for Maryland, when you consider there's tens of thousands of people who then lost their jobs, uh, not only because of the collective work that took place, not only did we end up with, uh, you know, once again, for the 12th month in a row, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country, Maryland actually gained over 7,000 jobs for the month of April. And when people said it, was, it could take up to a year. It took you 11 Weeks. 11 weeks. How? Because lots of people in this room think the government doesn't work for us, government projects take years and years. How did you go from a nine month to a one year long estimate to 11 weeks? By working together. Who was working together? Everybody. I mean, literally, I remember those first days, um, you know, watching the support of the federal administration. And I want to be clear the first phone call that I got from the White House was at 3 30 that morning. And the president, when, when you hear in a moment like that, that I knew that my job was to provide comfort and support and confidence to the people of my state that we were going to make it through this, I cannot stress enough how when you get a call from the president of the United States saying, Gov, we're going to be with you every step of the way, the same thing that I was trying to provide for my state the president provided for me, and I cannot, I cannot stress enough how remarkable the Biden-Harris administration has been. Um, our local leaders, uh, the fact that, you know, the fact that within hours, I mean, as soon as that phone call came, we were on the phone with members of our state police who had divers in the water within an hour working to save lives. We had members of the National Guard who were involved. We had aerial assets that were then providing light on the situation. We had a Department of Transportation who was rerouting, who was rerouting uh, our, all, of our, all of our transit workers because that bridge accounts for about 40,000 people take that bridge every single day and who were about to wake up and realize that they had no way of getting to work. But you made other calls within a week. There's a lot of people who believe that there are some elected Democrats who are anti-business, <laughs> that think big business is no good, they're here to take advantage of us. You didn't have that take. No. After the bridge collapsed, you said, who can I talk to in business, in technology, in infrastructure, in bridge building to help me get smarter that's not just part of the government? Help us understand that, because that's something that we often don't think Democrats do. And I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand how you can be anti-business. I don't. I, okay, I'm, let's I'm, be clear. No one here is anti-business. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to be clear. I will say no that one. in any room that I'm in. Because who, who's helping to provide the jobs? Who's providing the innovations? Who's making sure that we can be the most competitive, not just state, but the most competitive country on earth? We, anyone who thinks that you can do this without the private sector, I wish you the best of luck. 
but you're probably not going to be in your job for very long. And you shouldn't be. Because it is true. Some of the first calls that I made were to members of the private sector. And I can tell you right now, there's no way that we would have recovered the way we did without members of the private sector who said, Gov, I'm not going to lay off my workers, despite the fact that the Port of Baltimore is now closed. The members of the private sector who said, Gov, even if I have to temporarily move my business to another port because we've got shipments that are literally on the way, as soon as the Port of Baltimore reopens, we are committing to you. We're coming back to the Port of Baltimore. There's no way that we go from having, you know, again, having some of the greatest fears about what the unemployment numbers could have been for the month of April to once again Maryland having almost the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country without the private sector stepping up. That we launched something called the Maryland Tough Baltimore Strong Alliance. And with that work was actually working with members of philanthropy and the private sector who literally within days had committed over $16 million to support our port workers and their families. You don't have progress by thinking that you are going to be anti-business or do this on your own. Progress, I mean, partnership produces progress. And that partnership includes the private sector. And anyone who is worth a salt has to understand that and embrace that. It's great that the president called you and said, I've got your back. It's great that you said to the people of Maryland, I will make you whole. We will not suffer economically. However, why is it an automatic that the government should have to pay? Because when the government says, don't worry, we're going to pay, that actually means taxpayers pay. How, how do we not know that, well, who ran this cargo ship? Yeah. Was this ship up to code? Why should the taxpayer immediately say, well, listen, it's great. The government's going to pay for it. Maybe we shouldn't. Well, I, I actually think that for this situation, this is not something that we're asking the government or taxpayers to pay for it. Uh, you know, what we're pushing for right now in, you know, a 100% cost share is not saying, hey, taxpayers, bail us out. A 100% cost share is basically saying this. We are very clear that between the insurance around this collapse and also with the, with the pending potentially pending litigation that's coming. And again, Lloyds of London has indicated this is going to be the most expensive maritime tragedy in our nation's history. So I am very clear, the American people are gonna be made fully whole on this. But what the reason that we have the 100% cost share is speed. I can't wait for litigation to conclude in four years. I need that bridge back up now. And the commitment that we have the commitment that we have to the people of this state, because you can't have a fully functioning Port of Baltimore if one of the main arteries to the Port of Baltimore is no longer there. There's only, there's three main ways for, for our cargo to get to the Port of Baltimore, uh, not including the Maritime, right? It is the Harbor Tunnel, it's the Fort McHenry Tunnel, and it was the Key Bridge. Here's the problem. All hazmat material cannot go in tunnels by law. So that means, so that also means gas, Trucks, those type of things, they cannot go in tunnels. So their main mo method and main mode of transportation to get to the Port of Baltimore was the Key Bridge. And the Key Bridge is a bridge, and the, the Port of Baltimore is something that supports two-thirds of this nation's economy. Right? It's the largest port in the country that focuses on new cars, on heavy trucks, on agricultural equipment, on spices and sugars and coal. You need to have a fully functioning port. And so the reason that we, that we need the 100% cost share and why I'm so encouraged about the bipartisan support that we've gotten to get that done is this is about I need this done on time and on budget. And that's the commitment I'm making to the American people. They are going to be made whole, but we've got to move fast and we've got to get it concluded. And we're going to show that in this time, we can actually get big things done when we choose to actually work together on them. The people who lost their lives that night were working the graveyard shift on that bridge. Yeah. In order to get this bridge, this project rebuilt, you need labor. You need a workforce. Maryland is a recipient of a whole lot of other infrastructure money because of the Infrastructure uh, Act, now law that the president pa or the Congress passed. We're going to need workers to do it. Yeah. In order to get these big projects done, how important is expansive legal immigration? Huge. You, you can't, so much of the work that, that is required, not just in Maryland, but also around the country, uh, cannot get done unless we have a solid, strong, legal immigration system. And that's frankly why so much of the conversation about how are we fixing, uh, how are we fixing immigration issues and the, this, this, this law jam we have is so unbelievably frustrating. You know, I, I think about it where, you know, I, I represent a state that is incredibly uh, politically diverse. 
and you don't find many issues that you can get Andy Harris and Jamie Raskin to agree on. <laughs> right? These are two people. I think, I think the only two issues that they agree on are that there should be 100% cost share for the, for, the, for the Bridge Act for Baltimore, and we need to fix the immigration system. And it's both coming from a place of economics. It's both coming from a place of we have, we have places, spaces, and districts that rely on legal immigration. And whether you're talking about Jamie Raskin, who represents the high-tech industry, or whether you're talking about Andy Harris, who represents the chicken farmers and the crab pickers, both know the importance and the reliance of a legal immigration system. Um, I, I, will, I will say this, though, and, and, I, and I was listening to part of the conversation earlier, which I thought was, um, which I thought was really interesting on uh, how the conversation around immigration reform does hit differently in different communities. And there is a frustration oftentimes, and particularly in the African-American community, about this issue of, about the, the push on, on legal immigration. And I, and I want to explain, is that uh, we understand, and I'm very much advocating for that we have got to fix our immigration system. We understand that in order for our economy to continue to grow, we need to have a strong funnel of a legal immigration system. I understand that much of the growth that we've continued to see in the state of Maryland, both in terms of population and GDP, is also because of immigrants that's coming to our state. I think part of the challenge, though, is we need to make sure that we're not having this conversation around immigration in isolation. Because if we're having a conversation about legal immigration and the economic benefits of it and so on and so forth, I'm going to be just you know, very honest. Uh, the absence of a conversation about things like the racial wealth gap, it hits ears differently. Where there seems to be a national push to make sure that we're doing a better job of integrating, uh, having a, a real robust conversation about immigration, one I very much agree with, but we're not acknowledging the fact that the racial wealth gap in this country has cost this country $16 trillion in GDP over the past two decades, and we don't seem to have a solution for that. So I just think it's really important that we do not have these conversations in isolation. And I think part of the challenge we've had in being able to make sure that it is a, it's both a robust conversation and one that everyone is rooting for is because they have been happening in silos. And we've got to be able to fix that. And I think How? we fix that. Well, I, I think we need to be, be able to actually make sure that this conversation is real. We're, we're, we're talking about, you know, we seem to have, you know, folks oftentimes who talk about the benefits and the promise of immigration, but are afraid to talk about why black wealth is so important. That we're talking about, here's the economic benefits of this issue, but we cannot really put a pinpoint on why is it important that we can, that we can actually move towards an idea that communities have long, have long been disparate. Why in our state, for example, why we have an eight to one racial wealth gap, and we all know that's not because one group is working eight times harder. There are policies. There's histories to this. There's the Homestead Act. There's the unfair application of the GI Bill. There's unfair appraisal values in historically redlined neighborhoods. And these are all things that are real that people feel, but feel like are not a part of the conversation. And I, so I think the way we have to address it is it's absolutely right to talk about the GDP impact to make sure that we get, that we get immigration done. It's absolutely right to talk about how this is about American competitiveness. It's also right to be able to say, if we do not address issues like the racial wealth gap, we're going to have a very difficult time making sure that we have a competitive economy. Because you cannot have a competitive economy if you do not have a participatory economy at the same time. So when you talk about these conversations, when you talk about the conversations that we need to have, what you're talking about, I believe, is effective communication. That's right. None of these things that you want to do are going to happen if you don't get reelected. Much of what uh, you want to do will be uh, hampered if President Biden doesn't get elected. Yep. Help us understand why so many things that have gotten done that'll be great for so many parts of this country, right? The CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act, it goes on and on. Why don't people know about it? Why is this administration doing such a poor job saying to people, 
I'm going to explain to you about your student get getting, debt getting forgiven. I'm going to explain to you that you can now get your uh, hearing aid over the counter. Where is this disconnect? Even the economy, and while inflation plagues the country, my God, we've had an extraordinary recovery from COVID, yet scores of people don't seem to know this. Why? Well, I, I, in many ways, I think you just hit the nail on the head because if I go into Hagerstown or Habit de Grace or Highland Town and I say, so what impact is the CHIPS Act? had in your life. They're like, what's the CHIPS Act? <laughs> or, or the IRA or whatever. But they have had direct and distinct impacts on that, right? It's part of the reason. And, and you know, and, and I think about it even in terms of this election. And I am, I am as full-throated a supporter of the president. I will go anywhere and everywhere to make sure that the president gets reelected in November. But it's very, and it, but it's very personal, right? Um, and it's not because I'm afraid of the alternative. I actually think that's a losing argument. Wow, that's not the argument even the White House is making. It, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a losing argument. They're not making that argument. They're saying, don't vote for that guy. They're not saying, vote for me because of X, Y, and Z. I do not think that you are going to mobilize the communities that we serve and the communities that we're in right now by telling them to be afraid of the alternative. You're not going to win an election like that. I think you've got to make them hopeful and optimistic about the future. And I think about it this way. I think about our first 18 months right? In our first 18 months, we've been able to reshape the way we think about economic growth. Mm -hmm. We've been able to make sure we're investing in things like trade programs and apprenticeship programs that while we have some of the best four-year institutions in the country, we are making it very clear that we are going to end this myth that every single one of our students must attend one of them in order to be economically successful. And we made historic investments in our remarkable community colleges that we have in the state of Maryland and our remarkable trade programs that we have in the state of Maryland that we've been able to make sure we're adjusting permitting and, and regulatory restrictions that make it so difficult for businesses to be able to grow and doing a better job of supporting entrepreneurs, adding access to capital for entrepreneurs, being able to make sure we're addressing things like public safety, where, where if you look at where Maryland was, Maryland before we came on board was literally had eight straight years while we watched the homicide rate nearly double, the non-fatal shooting rate in the state of Maryland double. Baltimore City had 300 plus homicides for eight straight years. Now, going on in our 18th month, the homicide rate in, the Baltimore, has had, in Baltimore has had the steepest drop of any major American city in this country besides one. The homicide rate in the, state of, in the city of Baltimore right now, if we can keep this pace, the last time it was this low, I was not born yet, right? That we came in. Maryland was 43rd in unemployment. Now we've gone 12 straight months with the lowest unemployment rate in the entire country, that we've been able to make investments in things like the Frederick Douglass Tunnel. We've been able to make investments in, in mass, mass transit and also mass transit lines. And yes, we've been able to clear a key, a key bridge that suspected was taking 11 months, now it took 11 weeks. Now, the reason I bring all that up is this. Because he'd like to get reelected. Because I would like to get reelected. <laughs> and none of that will be possible without the Biden-Harris administration. And this is the point. This is the point. I'm telling people, support the president not because you're afraid of the alternative. Support the president because I tell the people in my state, look at what we've gotten done in 18 months. Imagine if you give me another four years. Look at what's possible when you actually have a government that works together. Look at what happens when you have a government that's coordinated. Look at what happens when you have a government that's working with the private sector and the nonprofit sector and community groups and activists and everyone who feels like we have a seat at the table. Look at what happens when government works. And I think we've got to do a better job of being able to mobilize that as surrogates, as advocates, as we're going into our communities and people are very happy with what they're seeing in our states. And if you look at the poll numbers, well, the government, things are going quite well. However, We've got to do a better job of making that connection to show them why this partnership matters. You brought up a great point, though. You said, you know, if you go to Hagerstown, Maryland and say, how's the CHIPS Act working for you? People look at you cross-eyed. Yeah. Here's the problem. What the Biden administration has done is some extraordinary long-term projects that will create long-term solutions. And we live in a world of short-termism, mm -hmm. of many people who might say, but I got a check for $2,000 with Donald Trump's name on it. <laughs> And, you know, that check was gone within three weeks. How do you communicate? And, and it's one of the reasons why Mike Bloomberg always said, before this infrastructure law passed, he always said, nobody ever gets anything in infrastructure done because they know by the time shovels are in the ground or the ribbon gets cut, you'll be out of office. How do you convince the American people 
all of these things that I'm doing are going to pay dividends for the future because there's a big disconnect there. There is, and, 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 I, and I think you have to be able to do both. I think you have to be able to do the things that have the measure of immediacy, immediacy and also know that you have to invest in the, in the long-term future. And so, for example, you know, when we talk about things like how do you, uh, how do you address the issue of public safety, for example, there's a lot that we are doing when it comes to the long-term investments within public safety, long-term infrastructure investments, investments, you know, historic investments that we're making in law enforcement, historic investments that we're making when it comes to supporting, when it comes to supporting state's attorneys and U.S. attorneys. In fact, we're the only state in the country now that actually supports the U.S. attorney's office from the state budget because some of these cases, and we're very focused, I'm getting these violent, violent offenders and these trigger pullers off of the streets, even if it means putting federal cases on them, right? So we're very clear about those long-term investments that both going to show immediacy, but also have long-term tails. And you've got to show people that you're able to do the work right now that's actually going to impact them. And, you know, and I tell people that when you're talking about long-term economic growth, we did something uh, a week ago that focused on pardons. And 170,000 people yeah. from Maryland. Yes. And it, was, and, it was, and it was crucial to be able to do this, not just from a fairness perspective. For the Our fact audience probably doesn't know. They live in Colorado. Everybody's smoking weed. Well, that's so, true. So but here's the problem. Explain what happens. That you can have people, that you can have a, a legal recreational market and people who still can't get jobs. That's the problem. Tell them what you did. So we ended up signing uh, the largest mass pardon for cannabis convictions in the history of the United States, where 175,000 convictions were just wiped clean. And there was a reason for it, is that Maryland voted to have a recreational cannabis market. You know, we, end, we ended up winning our election uh, by 65% uh, when we ran for governor. The only thing that beat us was cannabis, which won by 70%. Um, I was like, who's cannabis? And how the hell are they so popular? Um, but, why, but why this matters is overwhelmingly the state said we need to have a recreational cannabis market. So we rolled out what many people believe to be the most equitable, uh, over 174 new social equity licenses. So you, now you have new people who are entering into this industry, creating new pathways for wealth and the most successful recreational cannabis market. But here's the problem. We had people who still could not get student loans. We had people who still could not get small business loans for their entrepreneurial aspirations. And so we basically said, you cannot celebrate the benefits of legalization if you do not wrestle with the consequences of criminalization. And so we basically said, well, we are now just going to put together a pardon that again now becomes the largest mass pardon in the, the, for cannabis in the history of this country. Here's why also that matters. We now have new people that are able to enter into an economy, that are able to get jobs, that are able to get small business loans, that are able to now know that their participation is necessary. That is something that people see not just an immediate consequence of, but there's going to be long-term implications when you're adding people now to, a, to an economic flow and making sure that we're not punishing some people for something that is no longer illegal in our society. So I think there has to be a balance in the way we're talking about long-term structural investments, which were huge and important. I mean, I think about the infrastructure, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, you know, that's already delivered over $12 billion to the state of Maryland, which we are actively putting to work. I think about things like the, the, the IRA, which delivered over $270 million to the state of Maryland that we leveraged to actually quadruple our offshore wind goals that we are actively now putting to work. There has to be the long-term investments. And at the same time, you've got to make it real to people right now as to why this matters and how this is going to impact them and their families. You say the word bipartisan and you put it in lights. And there are a whole lot of people, elected officials in government, that believe bipartisanship is a bad thing. Hmm. You actually reject the idea that the country is so polarized. And when you were running for governor, you ran against uh, a Donald Trump endorsed uh, the, maybe the most MAGA person running for, for an office that high in the country. Yeah. But you were still willing and open to knock on every door in the state of Maryland. Yes. Why? Um, you know, I, I think about when we first started our race, we were, we were polling at 1%. Uh, well, you were running against like 42 people. It's true. 
But, uh, but it's true. But, but uh, like in our first poll, like I'm not voting was polling higher than Westmore. Like this is a very humbling experience. Um, but we ended up winning with more individual votes than anyone who's ever run for governor in the history of the state of Maryland. The reason I bring that up is this. No, thank you. But the reason I bring that up is this. You don't get that number by winning just Democrats. We won Democrats. We won independents. We won a good chunk of Republicans. And it was a philosophy where, you know, when I was 17 years old, when I first joined the Army, and we learned something in our second day of military training where they taught us this idea of leave no one behind. Ever. Oh. Leave no one behind. You get one of my people, I will send a battalion in to go get them if I have to. And that's the approach we've taken to governing. But what did you learn? Because the person who you ran against is an election-denying, yep. pro-insurrection yep. candidate who actually had, obviously he didn't win, but quite a few people support him. What did you learn when you met those people who were buying into all of that? What did they tell you? Uh, first, they were, they were surprised that I showed up. I believe that. But I think that mattered because you got to show up. You know, we have spent our time going all around the state to include places that we didn't get their votes. And they've said, you know, you're spending a lot of time here and there's not a lot of Democrats. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a lot of Marylanders. And you knew you weren't going to get their votes. But, well, I did not know that. Because I am convinced that if we can spend time and we can make our argument, you won't get everybody. But they'll never be able to say you didn't show up. I, I think about one of the, the, the first visit that I made as governor was to Western Maryland, to a place called Lona Coney, because they were having a, a, a water crisis. So they're having a bowl water advisory. So we heard about it, and I called the mayor, and I said, Mayor, I'm on my way. So I go see the mayor, and a guy named Mayor Coburn, who's become a good friend, and he said to me, he said, Governor, do me a favor. Turn 360 degrees. So I turned 360 degrees. He said, the only guarantee I can give you, you ain't see a Democrat within five miles of anywhere you just looked. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, but he said, but you're the first governor that's been here since 1996. I honestly think we give up too easy. We, we spend time like looking at our state and parsing, who, who, do, who can you get? What vote do you need? And when people ask me, well, who do you need to win? My answer is easy, everybody. Because I'm not just talking about an election. Well, you're going to represent everyone. You have to. And people need to know that if you, even if you plan on getting these bills done, how effective is a bill? You know, we've introduced 26 bills since I've been the governor. Not only have we gone 26 for 26, we've gone 26 for 26 bipartisan with Democrat and Republican support on every single bill that we have introduced. And here's why that's important. Because I'm not concerned with just passing bills. I'm concerned with making people's lives better. So what have you accomplished if you've gotten a bill passed with the, with the exclusive support of one singular group, and then it's never actualized. If the people in communities don't feel like you've actually benefited their lives, if the people don't feel like you've done something that can help them. And so I have decided we concede nothing. We concede nowhere. We go everywhere. And we make our case. Because I can tell you, when I was leading soldiers, uh, you know, I was a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne. Do you know a question I never once asked my soldiers? What's your political party? Never got brought up. And so I don't plan on starting that now that I'm the governor of my state. Yet you belong to a political party that people often say is un-American. Republicans have, I'm not going to say hijacked, I'm going to say it in a loving way, have adopted the word patriot yeah. and patriotism. And oftentimes when you see an American flag flying, which I'm guessing as a governor, as a veteran, the American flag means everything to you. Yes. Yet oftentimes if we see someone hanging an American flag, we think, oh, that person's a Republican. When did that happen and why? And what are you going to do to take it back? It's remarkably dangerous. Um, I fought under that flag. I fought for the values of that flag. I fought for the people that that flag represents. And I would do it over and over again. Um, because How come it seems to be the, the flag for Republicans now, though? 
Well, I, I, I just think we have to take the same type of approach. We concede nothing. And I think we have to be unafraid to push back. I, I think when you see someone who's claiming that patriotism uh, means denying elections, or that patriotism means restricting freedoms, or that patriotism means that certain parts of our communities should be heard more than others, then I think we have to be unafraid to push back and say, my definition of patriotism is making sure that everybody is seen. The thing about this country, you know, this country is this beautiful patchwork. And we have to be honest about there is a measurement of unevenness that this country sits on and relies on. It's history, it's founding, and we have to be honest about that. But we also have to be honest about this. The progress that this country has made has both been undeniable, and it's also because people believed that progress was possible, that everybody can be seen and heard. And so my definition of patriotism is making sure that every single person that exists in our state and in our country understands how needed they are for our country's vibrancy understands that no one should ever have to continue to justify their own humanity or their humanness. No one should have to justify their belonging. No one should have to justify their place. And so for people who want to say that, uh, that, that, you know, that the American flag somehow represents divisiveness or by you know, flying the American flag represents a singular political party, I would just simply say history proves different. That we've made progress under this flag. We've had people who have given their lives for this flag, for its values, for its hopes, for its aspirations. And for people who really believe in the idea of patriotism, I know patriots. I served with patriots. I was raised by patriots. People who believed in this country even when this country didn't fully believe in them. And they continued to fight on behalf of this country. That's patriotism. And I think anybody who wants to try to prove different or stands different. They just need to know they are going to continually and repeatedly be challenged, and we will win that argument. Wes, um, I know you don't like this truth, but cynicism runs high in this country. There are maybe more people than ever that have lost their faith in, the, in government. When you think about... Um, People have lost faith in the Supreme Court and then Congress. That's terrible for our country. Mm -hmm. What needs to be done to restore faith in our government, to inspire America? So I, I think, um, so one, I think the cynicism is real. And, and, I, and I think, honestly, the cynicism is justified. Uh, you know, I, I, I think about it in, in, in our race. You know, I had to convince some members of my family to vote for me. Um, was it your wife? No, no, she, she was all in. She was all in. Um, but, you know, but part of it, and it's not that my family and I aren't cool. Like, my family and I are cool. It's just that I had to convince some members of my family to vote. Because we don't come from a political family. And frankly, we come from a family that is ripe with measurements of cynicism, and they're right to be cynicism, to be, to be cynical. And, I'm gonna be, and, and to be very honest, I still carry a lot of that cynicism with me, and I'm the governor. But I know that cynicism will always be my companion. It just won't be my captor. Say that again. That cynicism, <laughs> that cynicism will always be my companion. It just won't be my captor. It'll always be something that sits with me. Because I think that cynicism is something that we consistently have to wrestle with. I actually think that's part of the American journey. That part of the American journey means we must wrestle with our history. We must wrestle with our present. And I don't think we ever want to lose that. But it cannot be something that dominates the way we think about our future. And so I think the way you address cynicism, A, I think it's twofold. One is I think you actually have to have results. And I think the part of the thing that we've been able to see, you know, in our state where, you know, we became the first, you know, the first state in this country that now has a service year option for all of our high school graduates. We became the first state in this country. You know, we became the first state in this country that now actually has a place-based investment strategy called the ENOUGH Act, which stands for engaging neighborhoods, organizations, unions, governments, and households, i.e. everybody. 
to engage in the idea of tackling and ending this issue of childhood poverty and generational childhood poverty in the state of Maryland. We became the first state in this country that addressed the issue of these cannabis partners. That Maryland is unafraid to lead, but importantly, what we're showing is that we can deliver results for the people. And I think results do matter because results help to counter cynicism. The other thing is this, and I brought up the idea of the service year. When we became the first state in the country that now for all of our high school graduates, they have a chance to have a year of service to the state of Maryland. And they can choose however they want to do it. They can serve in the environment. They can serve in housing. They can serve veterans. They can serve young adults. They can serve returning citizens. It's completely their choice. The only thing we ask for them is this. Find that thing that makes your heart beat a little bit faster. And then go after it. And then they have a paid year of service, an opportunity to have a paid year of service with a $6,000 stipend at the end that they can use however they want to use it. But what it's doing is it's both addressing the issue because we're big believers in experiential learning. We're big believers in, in the idea of an earned financial cushion, particularly for that age grade of 18 to 25 where people are still trying to figure it out. We're big believers in workforce development and workforce training. And in this time of political divisiveness and political vitriol, Service will save us because service is sticky. And those who serve together will stay together. And I know I have people who I serve with in Afghanistan who came and campaigned for me in doorknots. Many of them were not Marylanders. Many of them were not Democrats. But they came and doorknocked on my behalf and they were simply saying, let me tell you about the guy that I served with. And so I believe in this time of cynicism, if we can create a culture of service where people are willing to fight for each other, where people are willing to get to know each other again, when we can be, as the military taught me, learn how to be mission first and people always, if we can do that, we are going to be able to strip away this wall of cynicism that for some people, this idea of cynicism means forfeiting. And for me, cynicism is actually something that can be our strength that we actually can and we should get to a better and a brighter future together. So I don't know if it's cynicism, I, maybe it's a backhanded compliment, but yesterday I was talking to Lori Tisch, one of New York's most impactful philanthropists, a truly great Lori. New Yorker, and we were talking about you being here. And she said, people are gonna ask Westmore two questions. They're gonna say, is Biden dropping out and would you step in? Let's be clear. Every person who asks you the question knows the answer. He's not dropping out. Correct. So I guess it's a backhanded compliment to you, but why are you being asked that question? What are people really trying to get at? Or how do you feel when they say it to you? Because um, people say it a lot. I, um, I think about what President Biden has meant to me and what he's meant to my state. Um, I'm thinking about a person who, uh, you know, when he, when he first came on board, we literally had a country um, that was ripping apart, it seems. Um, you don't think we are now? No. I, I, th I think we still very much have divides in our society that we still have to wrestle with. Um, but it's really nice having a president who's willing to wrestle with it and who's not willing to actually further create seams. It's really nice to have a president who... I know actually believes in our better angels and is willing to fight for them. Uh, it's nice to have a president who really has devoted his life to public service and have a president who's spending his time focusing on our futures and not his own. Um, Now, and, and listen, I, I, I understand the fresh, because I, I, I hear it every day, um, that there is a complexity for a lot of people where they feel like, you know, we've, we've seen this movie before. You're exciting, <laughs> and people are not excited. Well, I, I, and I think people feel like, you know, we had the same matchup in 2020, and there's a frustration, I, and, I, and, I, and I think we all have to be honest about it, and I, and I get that. I also know this, right now, we have a binary choice. And in November, this country is going to make a choice. And for me, the choice couldn't be more clear. And again, it's not, it's not I, I don't think that people need to spend time focusing on the dangers of Donald Trump or Trumpism. 
I think that people need to really focus on the things that we can actually proactively get done. I know the partner that I have in the president. I know I have a person who keeps his word. And when he says, Gov, I'm with you every step of the way, I want to be very clear. This president has been with us every step of the way on our entire journey. And I respect that because I respect people that keep their word. And so I, um, I, understand, I understand the complexity and the frustration. I do understand that this is still a very divided country. And no matter what happens, this country is going to need a real sense of healing. Uh, I just know in a binary environment, we have a person who's going to focus on the healing and we have a person who's not. And I think that should matter to people as they make, that, uh, as they make their journey into, a, into the, the ballot box. People compare you to Barack Obama. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Don't act like you haven't thought about the answer. I, um, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I'm seriously playing with house money. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm a, and, 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 and you know this, I mean, I'm a, I'm a kid who was literally raised by an immigrant single mom who didn't get her first job that gave her benefits until I was 14 years old. And by the way, this is a woman who went on to earn a master's degree. So when we're having conversations about inequitable pay between men and women or inequitable pay between people of color and non, this is not an academic exercise with this. I don't need a white paper to explain it. I grew up with this that I'm a kid who had handcuffs on my wrists when I was 11 years old because I came up in a community that was over-policed and we knew it. That I'm a person who was sent to a military school when I was 13 because of some things I was getting into. I joined the Army when I was 17 years old and I was so young, my mother had to sign the paperwork for me. But after my teenage years, she would sign whatever paperwork they put in front of her. <laughs> that I'm a kid who graduated from a two-year college. And I'm now the 63rd governor of my state and only the third African-American ever elected as governor in the history of the United States. I, um, I'm so good. <laughs> and I love the momentum that Maryland is seeing when I say this is Maryland's decade. And I don't just say that, like we have receipts to show for it. And I love the fact that we now have a chance to do something really, really special for a place that I love. And, uh, and I just want to keep on having the ability to keep doing it. So I've, I've told the people, I keep a clock on my desk. I know for a fact I have 938 days left in my first term. Um, and I'm planning on running it back in 2026. Um, but I just know that if we're not going to make a single day wasteful. And as long as we can do that, then I feel like I, then I, feel like I completely understood the assignment. You are going to make Annapolis the new Aspen. There you go. <laughs> um, I want to open it up to some questions. Do we have any microphones? Hi, I'm Hello. Doran Pinnell, Duke Hi, University. Good Thank to see you, you for all you've done and are still doing. Thank you. I read an article in the New York Times that said at the Democratic Convention, President Joe Biden may say he's not running again, so that he, and then he'll still be nominated, but he could choose a different vice president. Could that be you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lori Tish was right. That's what they're going to ask you. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, I think about the, the accomplishments that we've been able to see um, with, uh, with President Biden. But I also want to be clear, the accomplishments and the partnership that we've had have been with the Biden-Harris administration. And we can't separate these two things. That if you believe in President Biden... You believe in the Biden-Harris administration because she's been his partner every single step of the way. I believe deeply in partnership. Um, I believe deeply that the Biden-Harris administration should get reelected in November. Um, and, uh, and I think not only will they very proudly receive their nomination uh, in Chicago next month uh, or in a month, month and a half, um, I, I think we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that the Biden-Harris ticket wins in November. How do you think the debate's going to go Thursday night? You know, honestly, I, I think um, my advice to the president, and I'm giving you all the advice that I gave, probably I'll give publicly. 
Um, I think the president just needs to focus on his vision for the future. I think to ask him to counter every one of Donald Trump's lies is going to be uh, unfair and it's going to be ridiculous. I actually think that there's other people and other things that can be done to counter every single lie that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth, which will be plentiful. Um, I think the president just needs to spend his time focusing on the vision for the next four years. She's coming. Hey, Alan. Hey, Wes. Uh, Governor, um, you know, you're only as great as you are with the people you surround yourself with, and you've pulled together an amazing team as well, and I think you'd say the same thing about President Biden. Tell us a little bit about the team. You were not an elected official before you were governor, and you went out and picked the very best talented people. You also married, right? Yeah. Your wife is here. She's amazing. Uh, Dawn, but tell us a little bit about the team and all the teams. She's leaving together. early. She I heard know. it. Yeah. She's, early. She's like, okay, I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, for, first, uh, poor uh, Dawn, the second she I gets know, up. I know. So now y'all can have to tell her about the confidence I get. I mean, I mean when, I, when I say, um, you know, I'm married up, I'm married way up because I, I, I literally married someone who, who makes me better every single day and in every single way. And there is no journey. There is no, there is no, there's definitely no more Miller administration without, without Dawn. Um, she makes me the happiest person on earth. And I thank God for her. Um, and it's true. And y'all can tell her that when, when you see her. Um, and, and I think one of the great things is about being a governor is you actually get to build. And I'm very, when people said that, like, what made you want to get into politics? I was like, I didn't. I wanted to be the governor. Because governor is a very different kind of role. Governor, you were the chief executive of your state. And it meant you had to build a team that actually is a reflection of how you view the world and what you actually want to get done. And so we were very clear that we did not necessarily want to go out and pick the people who came from Minneapolis or this or that. Pick people who just have a history of just getting big things done. And the best subject matter experts in their area, and again, starting with, you know, I believe, you know, we got the greatest chief of staff in, in America, in, in Fagan Harris, and I hope you all spent some time, you know, with him here. But if you literally go point by point within our administration, I will put our team against any administration in this country. And I'll win every single time. Because these are people who are responsive. These are people who are remarkable in their fields. These are people who have track records from the private sector, from the nonprofit sector, some from the government, but people who in every single area know how to get big things done, and that's exactly what they've been able to do. And so I just believe that if you want to see something effective, don't oftentimes look at the leader. Look at who the leader surrounds themselves with. And then I can tell you what's the probability of that organization being successful. And so when we were able to get this group of people to say yes, we knew we were on path to making the most effective and the most effective and hard charging team in the history of the state of Maryland and all throughout the country. And I think we've been able to do exactly that with this, uh, with this remarkable team that we've been able to assemble, who I'm deeply, deeply grateful for. We got time for like one more. Thank you. Um, you are so inspirational for us young, up and coming. Um, my you. name is Nana Fomin, and I am the Chief Medical Innovation Officer for Shed Harvest. And five years ago, we believed in the National Service, yeah. and we, a uh, collective of black emergency physicians, put money in to be able to fund people who are doing the work in the community. Yes. Um, you talked about all the benefits of national service, but one of the things that you've been able to do is scale empathy. And that's, I think, is powerful, um, especially and hope in our younger generation. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about, there was a piece that you added healthcare to this. Yeah. And as an ER physician, I was like, it blew my mind when I read it. I was like, what? So please, just, just brag about how you were able to get this done. And also, if you mind sharing, like, what was the naysayers doing and saying um, that you can offer to us? Thank you. I love that. I love that. Thank you. And it's true, you know, and, and part of the reason that things like healthcare became so important, I'm a, I'm a big, you know, I say, uh, as a leader, I am data-driven and heart-led, right? I wear my heart on my sleeves, and I acknowledge that. But I don't move without data. You got to show me data. And there are, there's nothing within our society that's going to give you a greater societal ROI than actually focusing on healthcare, than actually focusing on making sure your people are healthy. 
by making sure we can come up with proper supports. It's one of the reasons why we're really proud of the fact, even if you look at things like Medicaid expansion, where, Medicaid, where, where the state of Maryland, one of the fastest and largest Medicaid expansion platforms inside this entire country, because it's having significant ROI on labor force participation, significant ROI on GDP growth, significant ROI when it comes to basic elements of, of inclusion within our societal elements. And do you know also where we heard that and continue to hear that from was from young people. And, you know, and, and I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of young people because um, people say that, you know, we, and, and if you look at numbers, whatever like that, we do very, very well with young voters. And it's not just because I'm, you know, one of the youngest governors in the country. That's who fueled our entire campaign. I remember we lost count of people who were coming to our rallies and coming to our events when we were first running who were simply saying, actually, it was my daughter or my son who told me about you. And they said, I should come show up and I should come listen to you. And it, it worked out. I had, a, I had a book called The Other West Moore, which... Um, which a New York up, Times bestselling book. Yeah, which, which ended up becoming like curriculum in schools. So that didn't hurt. Uh, people were like complaining about it. I was like, uh, um, but, but it was one of these things where it was through them that we were getting all the answers we were looking for. That we were seeing the hopes and the aspirations that they had and we were moving on it. So when we were having, it was young people who powered our campaign and frankly powered our administration. It was young people who said, we need you all to be aggressive when it comes to the issue of gun safety and gun violence because no one should feel unsafe in the neighborhoods they call home or the communities that they call home. So when we became the first state in this country to now have a center for gun violence that's focused within our Department of Health and actually putting real, when we passed legislation, which by the way, I got sued by the NRA. It's fine, we won. Um, but when we passed what was common sense legislation that said things like, if a person has a history of mental health uh, or of mental illness and a history of violence, they should not be able to purchase a firearm. We got that from young people. When we passed legislation that said things like a person should not be able to bring a firearm into a nursery or into a government building or into an amusement park, young people helped to draft the legislation and we got it passed and I proudly signed it. When we put together the, when we put together the Serve Act and created a platform where we can have a service year option for all of our high school graduates, that was helped to be drafted by young people. When we put together our climate goal, saying that we want to be net zero emissions by 2045, that we want to make Maryland a net exporter of clean energy and not a net importer of clean energy, that we quadrupled our offshore wind goals. Do you know who helped to craft that legislation? Young people. And so oftentimes, I think the thing that we've been able to show is for us, young people, they don't want to be subjects of the conversation. They want to be part of the conversation. And our administration has been very deliberate about doing that. And frankly, it was young people that saw us first. It was young people that made a more Miller administration. And so it's young people that are going to power the more Miller administration. And I think that's just continued to resonate. Uh, in the way that, uh, in the way that they, they see us and the results that we're continuing to show. We are out of time. But I can tell you this one thing. As somebody who's known Wes for a long time, I can guarantee he's not playing with house money. He's a real deal. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.